It is with my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Ron Reidenauer, who is a veteran anti-war and civil rights activist, journalist, and author. Our first speaker is Joe Lauria, who has led a lifetime of journalism. He took over as editor-in-chief of Consortium News following the death of its creator, Bob Perry. Consortium News Live is also a co-sponsor and is broadcasting this event simultaneously. CN's coverage of the extradition hearings was the most extensive and comprehensive of all media. Joe and his staff, along with contributors, just celebrated 25 years reporting real journalism and revealing fake news fomented by the establishment's political parties and corporate media. Joe, tell us uh, about WikiLeaks, uh, some of its history and some of the aspects of the extradition hearings. Well, thank you, Ron, and thank you for that introduction about Consortium News. We did indeed celebrate our 25th anniversary. So I'm gonna spend uh, five or 10 minutes, if that's okay, to provide what I've been asked to provide, which is a short history of WikiLeaks and a detailed account of what happened during these four weeks of hearings in Old Bailey in London. Uh, Julian Assange, of course, is uh, integral to the history of WikiLeaks. He was born in Queensland, Australia in 1971, which happened to be the same year that Dan Ellsberg leaked the Pentagon Papers. In 1991, he was charged with hacking into a Pentagon computer and he uncovered evidence of a U.S. attack on civilians in a shelter uh, during the first Gulf War. He was arrested, but as a youthful offender, he was given a minimal punishment, but that has uh, created the stigma of Assange being a hacker, which is very important when we get to the charges against him. Um, in fact, the U.S. has tried to revive this idea that Assange is a hacker, but this happened many, many years ago. He started WikiLeaks in December 2006, a site to obtain and publish sensitive information. Of course, he first collaborated, and this is important with The Guardian, in 2007 on documents about the... Hi. <clears throat> President Daniel Arbois, uh, his corruption. He also began releasing his first documents on Guantanamo detention camp and did a series on Scientology, who threatened to sue. In 2008, Assange won his first media award from The Economist magazine. Many, many more would, would come, as many as 30, uh, including the uh, Walkley Award in Australia, which is the equivalent of their Pulitzer. And 2010 is the really key year in the history of WikiLeaks it was their most consequential year in terms of their releases, and it's also what the indictment focuses on, not anything after that, including the 2016 election. Uh, it started in April 5 of that year, 2010, that the collateral murder video was released. This is probably the best known release of the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of documents that, that WikiLeaks and Assange have released over the years. The collateral murder video showed uh, from the viewpoint of pilots on Black Hawk helicopters shooting down into a Baghdad street, killing uh, and injuring many civilians. It was clear at a certain point then that these were civilians and not uh, insur insurgents, and they continued to shoot anyway, even into a van that had come by to try to uh, attend and pick up the wounded and the wounded children that were in the van. It was a hideous video. It also was uh, horrible to hear the American pilots laughing and joking and blaming uh, the people below them. It was uh, a shock, but it was quickly forgotten and did not lead to any kind of charges or investigation into those pilots whatsoever. What it did lead to was the arrest of the source of that video and the all these major files of 2010, and that was Chelsea Manning, who was a private uh, with security clearance as an uh, intelligence analyst in Iraq, and she uh, could not bear to keep this secret she went to the Washington Post and New York Times with an order and then went to WikiLeaks. Following on that was um, the Afghan files and the Iraq war logs, but they came out after May 26th, just six weeks after the collateral murder video, Chelsea Manning was arrested for unauthorized dissemination of these cl classified documents. Actually, the collateral murder video was not classified, but certainly many of the Afghan files in July 2010 and the Iraq war logs of uh, July of that year, uh, sorry, of October, October was Iraq, July, Afghan. Those were, uh, revealed many other crimes and corruption that took place in those two wars. 
in then in November were the diplomatic cables, also from Chelsea Manning, and uh, that revealed many, many uh, internal documents from the U.S. State Department and their embassies, and we learned of uh, many things uh, around the world. And most consequential probably was that it led, many people believe, to the uprising in Tunisia, what was revealed about the Tunisian government, and that, of course, spread across uh, Arab countries in 2011 in the very, very well-known uprisings. Uh, some people credit WikiLeaks for that. Mohammed um, Muammar Gaddafi blamed WikiLeaks. He said, don't be fooled by WikiLeaks, which publishes information written by lying ambassadors in order to create chaos. So uh, he was reacting to what happened in Tunisia. The reaction back in the U.S. to all of these releases was fierce. Mitch McConnell's Senate Majority Leader was on Meet the Press, and he called Julian Assange a high-tech terrorist. Senator Joe Bi- then Senator Joe Biden was asked on Meet the Press whether he agreed with that, and his response was that he was more like a Assange, more like a high-tech terrorist than what happened in the Pentagon Papers. The Obama administration impaneled a grand jury, and they were they wanted very much to prosecute. WikiLeaks and Assange for these releases, but they came upon what with the with the holder, Eric Holder, the head of the Attorney General under Obama at the time, called their New York Times problem. What's that? Well, the New York Times, along with The Guardian, Der Spiegel, El Pais in Spain, El, uh, uh, Le Monde, published many of the same documents that WikiLeaks did, working in conjunction as partners with WikiLeaks. So if they were going to, the Obama administration was going to indict Assange, they how could they argue they wouldn't also have to indict the New York Times? So they dropped it. Um, of course, that changed when the Trump administration came in. But before that, in the same year, December 2010, Assange was arrested in Britain. He, uh, and that was because of manipulated sex crime allegations. Neither woman ever charged rape. There were never any charges against Assange. These were only allegations. Many people say there were charges. There were not. Assange was given permission to leave Sweden after this initial uh, talk with the police, and he went to the United Kingdom, where he, shortly shortly after he arrived, he was hit with a European arrest warrant that was arranged and issued by a prosecutor, not a judge. The law was changed after that because uh, a judge now should be issuing arrest warrants, not a prosecutor. Assange fought the extradition to Sweden in the UK courts, and he got to the Supreme Court, and he lost. And that's when he went and received asylum in the Ecuador embassy. The UK would not let Assange leave that embassy for medical treatment. He had various ailments. If they said if he left, he would be arrested. What was he wanted for at that time? Just bail skipping. He was wanted for uh, bail because he went into the embassy uh, rather than uh, face extradition to Sweden. And at the time, he and his lawyer said, they didn't believe it was extradition to Sweden. They were fearful that Sweden would extradite him onto the United States. People uh, ridiculed him for that at the time, but of course he's been proven right. It was about a U.S. extradition all along. Within the embassy, he continued to run WikiLeaks. There were many other revelations. Uh, the most important one after that was probably the 2016 U.S. election in which uh, WikiLeaks published, leaked DNC, Democratic National Committee, and John Podesta, the chairman, of the Hillary Clinton campaign. They're totally accurate emails. They revealed corruption in the Democratic Party. It led to the resignation of five member, high-ranking members, including the chairwoman of the Democratic National Committee. Uh, liberals and liberal media in the U.S. turned against Assange then. They had uh, pretty much liked him because he had revealed Bush administration crimes in Iraq and Afghanistan. But when it came to this election, they turned against him, somehow blaming him for Trump, even though the documents were completely accurate they were true. Uh, I'm talking about the emails. It didn't really matter who the source was, whether it was Russia or not. And Robert Mueller, as re- unredacted pages came out on the eve of just November 2nd, right now, just before this U.S. election, showing that Assange had no idea who he was talking with. So if it were the Russians, Assange didn't know it. Mueller's report said that it was redacted originally. And oddly, on the eve of the U.S. election, the unredacted came out. So we knew that's why he could not charge Assange, although Mueller did want to. He never interviewed Assange, by the way, in the embassy about what happened. Uh, The documents are true, as I say, it doesn't matter. And this is borne out by the fact that WikiLeaks is the one that pioneered anonymous uh, anonymous drop boxes, which is a source can give documents 
to WikiLeaks, and they don't even, WikiLeaks doesn't even want to know who the source is. If they can verify the documents are accurate and they're newsworthy, they will publish it. Well, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the, the uh, Guardian, and 60 major news organizations now use anonymous drop boxes, so they don't know who is giving them stuff if it checks out. That's what's important with documents, not who the source is. I mean, Russia could drop something in CNN's box. CNN could run the story and never know who the source was. It's not important when the documents are verified. Uh, after Trump was elected, there was a very major release, Vault 7. It reveals CIA cyber tools, uh, things like turning your Samsung TV at home into a spying device, even though you think it's off, uh, and many other things about what the CIA does, although WikiLeaks did not release tools that could be used by others. Uh, so they were important to remember that they redacted things. Nonetheless, that infuriated Mike Pompeo, who in his very first speech as a newly appointed CIA director called WikiLeaks a hostile non-state intelligence service, and he called Assange a coward, a fraud, and a narcissist. So revealing crimes and corruption of government and government officials is going to get them very upset, although they couch it in national security. It's very often their own security, their own skins that they're worried about. So a new government then was elected in Ecuador in May of 2017, and after two years with Mike Pence going down to Quito and U.S. generals, Finally, the Ecuadorian government got something in return for this wonderful prize that they had, Julian Assange in their embassy that the U.S. desperately wanted. And it was an IMF loan that was arranged and approved. And Ecuador allowed the British police into the embassy, even though he had asylum and he had Ecuadorian citizenship until that point, allowing the British police to drag him out, as we've all seen in April of 2019. He was thrown into Belmarsh Prison, where he's been ever since. The indictment was unveiled by the U.S., 17 charges on the Espionage Act, one on conspiracy to commit computer intrusion. The Espionage Act uh, is the most important, of course. James Lewis, the prosecutor for the, uh, for the U.S. government, the British lawyer, on the very first day of the resumed hearing in September, addressed the press box and said, this is not about you. He said, it's not about publishing, and we're not after the press. This is about Assange revealing the names of informants. And this kind of floored everyone. Uh, for the one thing, in, revealing informants was never, is, is not in the statute of U.S. law and is not named in the indictment as him having violated this. The indictment is also about Assange passively receiving and possessing documents, unauthorized possession of documents. And the government tried to say it wasn't about that, but many defense witnesses pointed out by literally reading from the government's own indictment. Later in the four week process in this hearing, the government, James Lewis, changed this idea by first saying Assange was not a journalist. It's not about journalists. We're not going after the press. We're going after this horrible guy with real names of informants. And they eventually uh, said in the hearing that, yes, it was about journalists. And he was a journalist. And journalists can be charged. And technically, they're right about that. Because a section of the Espionage Act says any person who has unauthorized possession and who then unauthorized uh, dissemination of that is liable under the Espionage Act to be prosecuted. There is no carve out for journalists, although Ro Khanna and uh, Tulsi Gabbard and the U.S. House of Representatives are trying to write a bill that would amend the Espionage Act, particularly because of the Assange case, that would make a, an exception for journalists. But as it is now, the government's right. They could get him on this. It, it is in the view of many people, and I know I, I'm really interested in what Marjorie says, that this is unconstitutional as it runs up against the First Amendment. There's a conflict there. And if that bill doesn't get through, one would hope if Assange is extradited to the U.S., and of course, those of us who understand this case hope that he isn't, uh, the, that his lawyers would challenge this as an unconstitutional law. So uh, many witnesses were brought on, defense witnesses, who explained that Assange was actually engaged in journalistic activity, protecting sources, asking for more information. This is what the indictment says. The indictment actually describe journalistic activity. Bob Perry, who founded Consortium News, in 2010 wrote an article during this whole period back then when those documents were being released, saying that he did the same thing as an investigative reporter known for breaking the biggest Iran-Contra scandals, that he would even encourage his sources to break a small law in order to prevent a larger one. So, and Dan Ellsberg gave great testimony on those uh, aspects at all, uh, uh, of that aspect of the case. The informants again became the major focus of the government, and they wouldn't, um, and they used as their main source a book by Guardian reporters David Lee and Luke Harding, uh, in which 
They're quoting Assange saying things like he didn't care if they people died, it was their fault for collaborating with the United States, etc. Now, the fact is there was a guard, a, a Der Spiegel journalist present at one of these meetings at a restaurant in London in which Assange was alleged to have said, I don't care if they die, they deserve it, the informants. Gertz was on the witness stand, but uh, Vanessa Beretta, the magistrate running this court, would not allow him to testify to that account. We were all waiting for him to say that and put it in the record, and he was not allowed to do that. In fact, an Australian journal journalist, Mark Davis, had said at a meeting in Sydney last year, I believe, that he was there in the bunker with the Guardian, and he saw Assange stay up all night the Friday before Sunday publication, redacting the names because he felt, he said that the Guardian editors went off to have a weekend and they didn't care. This is what he says. The New York Times actually first published these uh, diplomatic cables on uh, in a day before WikiLeaks did, but they were trying, but they published in their story that WikiLeaks had published first because that was the arrangement. WikiLeaks had a technical problem. The Times went first, but their article still says that WikiLeaks published first. Why is that important? Well, if these are classified information, if the government should go after them, who published first? Well, we learned in the court later on that when David Lee and Luke Harding in their book, um, in, in the book, I'm forgetting the title, they put the password to the unredacted cables which had the names of the informants. They put out the password when it became known and it was starting to be published and Cryptome.org published it first, then Assange had to publish it as well, he said, to try to inform these informants to get to safety. But Cryptome was never charged. John Young, who's the founder and still runs it, put an affidavit into the courtroom saying that he was never questioned by the police at all about this, even though he published it first. Before. And this is the unredacted cables with the informants named. Like I said, this is the main thrust of the U.S. case. Now, the big bomb, we also heard a lot about the health of Julian Assange. Many details we were asked not to report, and we didn't. But essentially, he's on the autistic spectrum. He is suicidal. Many, many uh, medical experts said if he were an extraditor to the U.S., he would very likely commit suicide. And uh, we also heard a lot about the condition of U.S. prisons, that he would be in isolation, most likely in a prison in Colorado. And the conditions were horrific, the way they were described, nothing that could compare in a British prison. And that's important because it has to be. Um, Dual criminality here, by the way, that's another issue about whether what Assange is being charged for is also a crime in the United Kingdom. So the big bombshell, though, in the testimony was that two anonymous witnesses from a case going on in Spain against David Morales, the CEO of a company called UC Global, they were allowed to testify in the British court, written, their names were not known. What they said was that Morales, the CEO of UC Global, spied on Julian Assange. Uh, for U.S. intelligence agency, an unspecified intelligence agency. They spied on his privileged conversations with his attorneys and doctors, and <laughs> the U.S. even discussed possibly kidnapping or poisoning Assange. This was testimony in the court. They put in cameras with audio. They tried to set up a 24-7 stream so that U.S. intelligence could watch everything that was going on, and the instructions were especially the privileged conversations with his attorneys. So here we have the intelligence armor prosecuting government spying on the defense preparations, eavesdropping on the defense pre preparations of the very hearing that then took place in September. In any other case, this would be thrown out immediately. In fact, when I reported this, Dan Ellsberg got very excited and he, he tweeted and wrote to me that uh, this is how he got off and that he expected that this could happen for drilling. This was his best chance. Of course, we all know what happened in Dan's case, that the government uh, tried to bribe the judge with the FBI directorship, and also, of course, broke into a psychiatrist's office and tapped his phones. So it, it, he, Dan said what they did to Assange was even worse than what they did to him. We also got testimony from Cassandra Fairbanks, the journalist, who said that Trump ordered Assange's arrest. That would be useful to the defense to prove it's a political case which violates the U.S. extradition treaty. The computer intrusion charge is all based on a jabber chat, a encrypted chat between someone named Nobody, who we later learned was Chelsea Manning, and someone called Nathaniel Frank. Now, many people assume Nathaniel Frank is Julian Assange. That's never been proven, and it's not proven in this hearing yet. <clears throat> so in order for them to charge Assange, I have to first say that he, Assange was in conversation with Manning. The indictment says that he tried to assign, he tried to get uh, help Chelsea 
break a cra- password so that she could sign in under an administrative password to hide her identity, which again is journalistic practice, normal routine journalistic practice to hide the identity of an anonymous source. It also says the indictment that Manning had legal access to all these classified documents. So okay. we heard, heard a uh, expert testimony saying that we couldn't even prove what they were trying to break into and that it could have been as uh, the fact that, sh- that Chelsea Manning was also downloading videos, music videos and video games because they are forbidden to active der- uh, service personnel, the military. So she was getting them for her, the soldiers. So this is very cloudy, this whole thing. Now, there was a superseding indictment that was only accepted by Barrett on the day the court began. WikiLeaks lawyers tried to delay the opening of the hearing. She refused. The indictment, superseding indictment just adds some more details to this computer intrusion charge, in, mostly from uh, details from two FBI informants who ratted on Assange back in when he was in Reykjavik at that time. So... They, these indictments says, the superseding indictment said he spoke at a conference and asked for people to send, to hack things and get stuff, but it doesn't say he hacked anything. He's never really charged with hacking at all in any of these charges. Now, the closing, I'm closing my, my submission here with, by mentioning the closing arguments. On November 16, five days ago, the defense was to have given their final submissions, or what we call in the U.S. closing arguments. We have not seen them. It's only in writing. The government in another week will be submitting uh, the government, U.S. government, their final argument, again, written. And we're supposed to see them publicly. We haven't yet. Judgment is coming on January 4th, 2021. Appeals are likely. This is a case of government officials trying to get, punish a journalist who revealed their crimes and other wrongdoing. And for decades, media has covered up a lot of these crimes that Julian Assange has revealed, and that's one reason the media is against him, and certainly why the government wants him extradited to the United States. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, you mentioned uh, Pompeo, and, and uh, I, can't, I can't avoid uh, reminding our audience, probably everyone has uh, seen this, uh, a great YouTube uh, of uh, this uh, Pompeo speaking last year to uh, AMN University, in which he said, uh, when I was a cadet at West Point, you know, becoming an officer, our motto was, you will not lie, cheat, or steal, or tolerate those who do. And then when I became a CI director, I learned that we lie, we cheat, and we steal. Now, of course, he didn't say that we also murder, uh, but he did say that this is like, you know, we take training courses, it reminds you of the glory of the American experiment. Now, I think that that is just about American exceptionalism, you know, that America is known uh, by its leaders as being a liar, a cheater, and a stealer, a thief. Marjorie Cohn has been an activist lawyer for the underdog, a professor of law, author, and prolific commentator on the side of the people for many alternative and professional media. Marjorie, tell us something uh, pertinent legal issues about this case and how Assange is doing and what you expect will be happening. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. I think it's important for people to understand that the reason that he is being indicted is because WikiLeaks published evidence of war crimes by the Bush administration. And in addition to the collateral murder video, there were the Iraq war logs, the Afghan war logs, and Guantanamo files. In the collateral murder video that Joe talked about, there was evidence of three different crimes under the Geneva Convention, uh, war crimes. First of all, targeting civilians. Secondly, targeting the rescuers of the civilians, because after these 18 people were murdered, these civilians, unarmed civilians, the rescuers were then fired upon by the U.S. soldiers in the Apache helicopter. And then 
one of the dead bodies was defaced and mutilated when a U.S. Army jeep drove over it and cut it in half. And that's evidence of three separate war crimes under the Geneva Conventions. In addition to the collateral murder video, we have the Afghan war logs, which showed a greater number of civilian casualties than the U.S. military had copped to, the Iraq war logs, which showed more than 15,000 unreported deaths of Iraqi civilians and the systematic murder, torture, and rape by the Iraqi army, and the Guantanamo files that documented the abuse and torture of men and boys in violation of the Geneva Conventions and the Convention Against Torture. And Joe talked about the redaction issue, and one of the things you see in the indictment against Julian Assange is that he endangered Iraqi and Afghan informants by publishing their names. But John Getz, an investigative reporter from Der Spiegel, testified at the extradition hearing that Assange took great pains to redact out the names of U.S. informants. He said that Julian Assange went through a very rigorous redaction process, repeatedly reminding his media partners to use encryption, and that Assange actually tried to stop Der Freitag from publishing material that could result in the release of unredacted information. Moreover, and this is something we don't hear much about, WikiLeaks revelations actually saved lives. After WikiLeaks published evidence of Iraqi torture centers the U.S. had established, the Iraqi government refused Obama's request to extend immunity to U.S. soldiers who commit criminal and civil offenses, and as a result, Obama had to withdraw U.S. troops from Iraq. Now, one of the things that Joe mentioned was that Julian Assange is accused of being a hacker, and the U.S. government is trying to stress that because they have had so much criticism for punishing him and indicting him for practicing journalism. And so they're accusing him of conspiring with Chelsea Manning, who turned over these leaked documents to WikiLeaks, conspiring with her to break in to a government computer to steal government documents in violation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. But a digital forensic expert testified at Assange's extradition hearing that the attempted cracking of the password hash was not technologically possible in 2010 when the conversation between Assange and Manning occurred. And even if it were feasible, the purpose would not have been to conceal Manning's identity and it would not have given Manning any increased access to government databases. Now, under the extradition hearing between the United Kingdom and the United States, which is the basis for um, this hearing, this four-week hearing uh, in the UK, in London, um, trying the Trump administration trying to get Julian Assange extradited to the US for trial, and he's facing 175 years in prison. The UK-US extradition treaty specifically forbids the extradition of a person for a political offense. The treaty doesn't define political offense, but it generally includes espionage, treason, sedition, and crimes against state power. Trump is asking the UK to extradite Assange for exposing war crimes. That's a classic political offense. And he's charged under the Espionage Act, and espionage constitutes a political offense as well. No media outlet or journalist has ever been prosecuted under the Espionage Act for publishing truthful information because that's protected by the First Amendment. Journalists are allowed to publish material that was illegally obtained by a third person if it's a matter of public concern. And the U.S. government has never prosecuted a journalist or a newspaper for publishing classified information, which is an essential tool of journalism. And as Joe said, Obama, who, who actually indicted and went after a record number of journalists, refrained from indicting Julian Assange. They considered it and refrained from doing it because then they would have to go after the New York Times, Der Spiegel, Le Monde, etc., 
But Trump, who is furious at anything Obama did and is out to cut that off, was very, very upset when Obama commuted Chelsea Manning's sentence as he was leaving office. She was sentenced to 35 years after serving seven years, Obama commuted the rest of her sentence and that infuriated Donald Trump. Now, there's another reason that Julian Assange should not be extradited under the law, extradited to the United States, and that is the Convention Against Torture, which is a treaty the U.S. and the U.K. have ratified that makes it part of the U.S. law under the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution. And the Convention Against Torture has a provision called non reformant and that forbids extradition to a country where there is substantial grounds to believe the person would be endangered of being tortured. Now, when Chelsea Manning was in custody in the U.S., she was held in solitary confinement for 11 months. That constitutes torture. And Julian Assange's health has severely deteriorated because of the U.K. government's refusal to allow him medical attention while he was under a grant of asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. And Niles Melser, a UN special rapporteur on torture, examined Assange and in May of 2019, confirmed that Assange exhibited signs of prolonged exposure to psychological torture. And as Joe said, he is also a risk for suicide. If he were sent to the United States, if he's extradited to the United States, and by the way, after Baratzer makes her decision on January 4th, and she has granted extradition in 96% of the cases that have come before her, and she even tipped her hand saying there was a high likelihood that he would be extradited, then there will be several levels of appeal in the UK courts and eventually an appeal to the European Court of Human Rights. But if he is sent to the United States, if he is extradited to the United States, and that won't be probably for a couple of years if it does happen, he would be held in a supermax prison, and there was testimony in the extradition hearing about this, in solitary confinement, under special administrative measures, denied meaningful contact with his lawyers, and given the torture that he has experienced, his severe health issues, which make him at particularly high risk for the coronavirus, and the fact that he's a suicide risk, would be devastating. And it would be very difficult for him to get a fair trial in the United States, because the U.S. press is likely to jump on board and talk about these discredited allegations. They weren't even allegations. They were, uh, there, there was talk in Sweden investigating him for sexual assault. Later, the complainers recanted and they dropped the investigation. But also, the case is filed in the Fourth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals in Virginia, um, which is where the so-called war on terror cases were filed. It's a very right-wing court. The media has vilified him. He'd be put in solitary confinement. He'd be denied meaningful contact with his attorneys. And so it would be very, very difficult for Julian Assange to get a fair trial. But the bottom line is that he is being prosecuted for revealing war crimes. And we have to keep that firmly in mind, regardless of what WikiLeaks did or didn't do before or after, that's what the indictment is all about. It's about revealing war crimes in Iraq, in Afghanistan, at Guantanamo Bay, and the CIA black sites. And if Julian Assange is extradited and indicted, and he is indicted and tried and convicted, and sentenced, this will send a message to journalists all over the world You publish material critical of the U.S. government at your own peril. It will chill the First Amendment freedom of the press, and it will be a blow straight to the heart of journalism and of media and the public's right to know. It's an extremely important case, and the fact that the corporate media in this country has engaged in a virtual blackout of news. You have to get it from the alternative media, from places like Consortium News, from sites that I write on, from other places like this webinar, is an outrage. And so we really have to do everything we can to free Julian Assange and prevent him from being locked up for 175 years for practicing journalism. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Marjorie. I, it's uh, just dreadful. I, in introducing our, our next speaker, it gives uh, us an occasion to salute whistleblowers around the world. Since uh, Daniel Ellsberg came out with the Pentagon Papers almost a half a century ago, uh, we've seen uh, hundreds of whistleblowers, insiders, uh, come over to the people. And I want to uh, just mention three or four names out of these hundreds. I think uh, Chelsea Manning has already been mentioned. I just think that it's very important for us to honor her for her tenacity, her bravery, and standing so solidly with the principle of not revealing anything that she may or may not know about Julian Assange. She has just done a fantastic uh, service to humanity. I think we need also to uh, recognize William Benet and Edward Snowden, who've revealed so much about the omnipresent global surveillance by the United States' so-called National Security Agency. And they, of course, uh, especially Edward Snowden, was uh, very much uh, assisted by WikiLeaks and Julian Assange personally. But also Catherine Gunn, a British woman who revealed many of the U.S. and U.K. war crimes against Iraq. Mordechai Van Unu, this is an Israeli who spent 20 years in prison because he revealed Israel's secret nuclear bombs, which are there illegally, of course. All nuclear bombs should be illegal. But uh, And there are so many more wonderful humans who have come out against uh, our oppressors. I thank you one and all. Daniel has not only been a whistleblower and a sterling author, his last book, Doomsday Machine, is, is a must read. But he's also been an anti-war activist, and I think he still is. And uh, this is how we met in Los Angeles during the Vietnam War resistance. Daniel, give us uh, some of your words. If Julian Assange is successfully extradited to the United States on these charges, no journalist in the world who presents information that has been stamped classified by the United States that has been given to her or him by any means, whatever, will be free of the danger of being extradited to the United States and is effectively kidnapped from any country that has an extradition treaty with the U.S. And uh, in the U.S. itself, the very prosecution of Julian Assange would be unprecedented as a journalist, a publisher. Uh, that has always been regarded as a violation, any such uh, proposed pro prosecution, and there have been considerations of such prosecutions before, and they've always been rejected by the Department of Justice on the grounds that it would be a blatant violation of the First Amendment, the freedom of the press in our country. Uh, they were considered, uh, the uh, New York Times reporters to whom I gave the Pentagon Papers back in 1971, were in fact subject to a grand jury at that time, which was dropped mainly, I think, because of the fact that uh, they were subject to the same kind of illegal surveillance that was exposed in my trial and which led to the dropping of charges on me. Neil Sheehan and Hedrick Smith were actually under investigation then, as was Noam Chomsky and Howard Zinn to academics who, to whom I'd given parts of the Pentagon Papers. And again, when they asked whether they had been subject to warrantless wiretaps, to illegal wiretapping, uh, they weren't further called to the grand jury, but they might well have been indicted anyway if had the charges not been dropped because of the revelation by whistleblowers, in effect, some within the government and out of the illegal surveillance in my case. Now, I do think the press at that time and ever since, and we're talking that was 49 years ago, have always, in my opinion, neglected to face up to the legal and constitutional aspects of these prosecutions, mine and all of the ones since, uh, on, in two ways. They've never really addressed the fact that uh, charges under the Espionage Act do not allow the defendant to justify her or his actions 
in terms of motives, uh, impact, potential impact, the benefit to the country that is uh, hoped for by the leaker, let's say, um, and what actual impact has had, whether it had any harm, actual harm or not. Uh, I was not allowed to answer the question, why did you copy the Pentagon Papers? It was held to be irrelevant by the prosecutor, upheld by the judge, and that has been true in every one of the cases since then of people who were sources like me uh, or like Chelsea Manning, uh, Tom Drake and others who uh, had been officials and who realized that they had been wrong or would be wrong in continuing to withhold from the public information that had been wrongfully uh, withheld from them and which the, where the secrecy and the lies that maintained it had led to the death of very many people or as in the case of Ed Snowden's revelations, uh, amounted to a abrogation of the Fourth Amendment and other aspects of the Bill of Rights and of our constitutional system in general. The wording of the Espionage Act, as I see on the one hand, doesn't allow for uh, discussion of motives, as in most cases, it's what's called a strict liability offense in which motivation is not an element of the offense or defense either. And that means that it's impossible for a whistleblower who is trying to serve the interests of the United States of his countrymen and uh, or uphold the constitution or to reveal lies or crimes uh, cannot, be, uh, cannot be discussed at all, which is, means the possibility of a fair trial is precluded. None of these people have had fair trials or could have a fair trial. And that's true as well of Julian Assange. But it's also the case that um, even the uh, Obama administration, which had prosecuted nine such cases of whistleblowers or leakers, classified information, which was three times the small number that had been prosecuted before, only three had been prosecuted starting with me. And the reason that was so low was that it was understood on the whole by lawyers in the, defense, in the Justice Department that it was against the uh, First Amendment, even to prosecute under the Espionage Act sources like me who had signed a non-disclosure agreement, which we were violating because it needed to be violated at that point in the interest of the constitution. As officials, we had all taken oaths to protect, to defend and support the constitution of the United States. And the crimes, uh, and unconstitutional actions that were being protected by classification were clearly violations of that oath if we continued to be silent about them. But it was clear that the language of the Espionage Act, which had not been written to cover whistleblowers or people who disclosed information to the American public, it was meant for spies. But nevertheless, the drafting of, of that act and its and amendments as uh, later enacted was so broad that it obviously could cover not only journalists and publishers, but even readers of uh, what they published. Anyone who had unauthorized access to that information, which the New York Times might have labeled uh, classified, which they often did. That's why we're not telling the source that they would say, would say because this information is classified. Knowing that uh, a person reading it and giving it to their spouse or their children or anybody else would be distributing that information rather than, and holding it, maintaining it, rather than giving it to the proper authorities, whatever that might mean in the case of a newspaper. Well, the journalists took the attitude they'll never, uh, they'll never apply that to readers and that hasn't yet been done, but the language is there. What's more serious though is that that language very clearly referred, how it could cover, the journalists. Now, clearly the First Amendment freedom of the press was meant to allow um, journalists to inform the public of what was newsworthy, what they needed to know, to know, to fulfill their obligations as citizens, actually, to hold the government accountable and to choose among their uh, representatives. But um, uh, the journalist said, well, it's never happened to us. 
and it only applies to these sources. And I can say as a source, not only in that occasion, but on others, uh, sources can't expect much respect from the journalists they deal with. Uh, they may expect something different, but they will be disappointed. Julian Assange, uh, well, Chelsea Manning, Snowden, Julian Assange, I think all experienced great contempt from the uh, other journalists that they dealt with. Only one of those was a journalist, Julian, but they all got profiles, as I did actually from the New York Times, uh, that were extremely, uh, not just condescending, but uh, falsely, virtually slanderous. And uh, that's a little surprising. People don't know that. I can say that from experience. But the uh, it, it's very good for a, uh, a journalist actually to be in the position of uh, being interviewed or being a source or something and have the experience of being misquoted. It's very uh, healthy for them in a way to discover how that works. But the journalist aspect, as Julian uh, is facing, directly cuts at the notion of a free press and actually a free press is the heart of a republic. As I've said on some occasions, unauthorized disclosures, disclosures other than handouts, information that the government has not chosen to put out freely about what they've done that might condemn their actions as criminal or deceptive, uh, unconstitutional. Unauthorized disclosure is the life's blood of a republic. Without it, with only government handouts, essentially, which is what every administration really secretly wants, but they haven't all taken as blatant efforts to uh, suppress that as the Obama administration did, followed now by the Trump administration, which has uh, indicted even more uh, people than the eight years of the Obama administration. But, uh, see, now the new one, not only the source, but the journalist themselves. And they're holding of this information, they're acquiring it, uh, as well as they're publishing it, uh, would, would uh, put us in the hands uh, of, a, of a state that can't really be called democratic, certainly with respect to foreign policy or what's called national security in a very broad sense, much of which actually impairs our true national security. But anyway, military matters, the military budget and uh, the threats that are posed by the very possession of some of our weapons. So there's a great deal at stake here. And as I say, the press as a whole has failed to inform themselves on the constitutional issues here. I know that because I've read the uh, I've read the articles on this by legal scholars, naturally, because of my own concern in this case and my continuing concern about the need for whistleblowing. And I found that journalists almost entirely are ignorant of these uh, of these issues, and they've remained so even now, when at last a case is being held against, I would like to say one of their own, one of them. But very, not coincidentally, the case of course is being brought against someone that they can choose to recognize as not being one of them, as being something other, something that hasn't yet reached them or confronted them with a real challenge. So they want to say that journalism, Julian Assange is not really a journalist. These are absurd positions basically. Uh, and is a very unpopular figure in many ways. And for a reason, by the way, that I'll just mention briefly, not for what he did in 10, 2010 uh, or 2013 when he helped Edward Snowden um, get out of Hong Kong, actually, with the help of his assistant, Sarah Harrison, who accompanied him to Moscow. But 2015 and 16, when uh, he is perceived very widely and with some reason as having uh, deserved the election campaign of Hillary Clinton. And uh, that made him very unpopular among my friends, shall I say, liberals, people who did not vote for Donald Trump. Uh, the fact is uh, uh, 63 million people did vote for Donald Trump. And uh, he was, uh, Julian was not unpopular with them. Uh, however, 
uh, following, uh, actually that doesn't bode well for the treatment he can expect from the administration of Joe Biden, who was vice president uh, into, uh, at that time. Uh, Hillary Clinton has been mentioned even as a possible um, official in the Biden administration. There's no question that she at that time, and, I, and as has been quoted by Joe Loria, Biden as well, were uh, extremely hostile. So on the one hand, we have the fact that the Obama administration, the Obama-Biden administration, did choose not to prosecute um, Julian, and that was absolutely right in turn constitutional terms, that uh, they could not prosecute him without prosecuting the New York Times as well. They didn't want to do that, and either one would be blatantly unconstitutional. So that would seem to be very promising then. That administration can be appealed to, and you say, you had it right that time. Uh, now you're now you're the president rather than the vice president. Uh, your Department of Justice should reach the same conclusion. But there's one thing that stands in the way. They reached those judgments back in 2013 and uh, around then, even 2015. 2016 gave them a very different feeling about Julian Assange. And the way these things go back and forth, Trump, the one who eventually in, indicted Julian, was saying in 2016, I love WikiLeaks. But, you know, once you get in office, the perspective changes. And uh, when uh, I think in, uh, now that we have a president elect, actually, uh, I, can't, uh, I can't count at all that they will not choose to press this case against the decision of the, of the prior Obama administration because of their feelings about 2016. Now, as Joe Loria brought out in his very comprehensive discussion of the case, uh, it has been revealed now that the, uh, in the evidentiary hearing about extradition, there was sensational revelations, I would say sensational, except ignored by the press, amazingly enough, except by a brief uh, AP story that I am aware of, that Julian had been subject to crimes by an American intelligence agency, almost surely the CIA, uh, conceivably NSA, but probably a national security um, agency, but probably the CIA, that he had been overheard even more extensively than I was on unwarranted wiretaps. In his case, he was surveilled every moment of the day and night, including in the women's bathroom uh, lavatory in the Ecuadorian embassy to which he had gone with his lawyers to speak in suspicion that he might be under surveillance otherwise and uh, not being apparently suspic sufficiently suspicious uh, of the reality, which was that there were wiretaps, there were microphones in the fire under the fire extinguisher and elsewhere in the plugs in the woman's bathroom, every inch of the place was surveilled so that everything that his doctors found uh, in discussion, but everything that he said with his lawyers, including their documents, which were surveilled, um, was in the hands of American intelligence uh, as, as arranged by, uh, by them at their request, actually. Now, in my case, when it came out that I had been overheard on warrantless wiretaps and that no record of this, which had been testified to, could be found in the FBI files because it was so clearly criminal uh, that uh, it had been moved to the White House, the evidence for this, to get it out of the FBI files. And that there had been efforts to incapacitate me, Daniel Ellsberg, totally. Those were the words, incapacitate Ellsberg, totally on the steps of the Capitol at one point. Uh, attempted assault or murder, in other words. These were among the things that came out. Um, amazingly enough, the very same discussion was taking place as is testified to by the people who've been working for this uh, global uh, center, surveillance center that was uh, based in, in Spain actually, but had the security contract with the Ecuadorian embassy. And they had discussed 
poisoning Julian Assange. Mm. Actually, in other words, the same the same things that were revealed in my case, and the revelation of which led to the dismissal of charges against me, with the judge saying that the totality of the circumstances, the bizarre circumstances, as he put it, offends a sense of justice and made it impossible to try me fairly. And my co-defendant, co Tony Russo, and charges were dropped. And much more importantly, these actions once revealed figured in a major way in the impeachment hearings of Richard Nixon, which led to his resignation and in that case made the war endable at that point, the war, uh, the Vietnam War. Now, these crimes almost certainly approved at the highest levels would be certainly worthy of being regarded as high crimes and misdemeanors as in the Nixon case, worthy of impeachment uh, of a president who has now, <laughs> though he's refusing to admit it, uh, has just been deposed by an election. But had he not, uh, had he in fact won as, he, as he's claiming, uh, these would have been appropriate charges to bring against him. The immediate point is though, it would be ridiculous to extradite to the United States an Australian citizen and Ecuadorian citizen under the U.S. Espionage Act, who not only could not be tried fairly in the U.S., even if these acts had not occurred, but against whom these crimes had been committed, and specifically not only with discussions of killing him, but with total discussion of his knowledge of his discussions with his lawyers. Um, it's, it's, it's absurd for yeah. him still to be in prison. And as we've just learned in the last few days, locked down in a prison that has had in his own cell block uh, several COVID cases. And so he's, for his own security, everybody has been locked down in there. He's been in effect in isolation now for uh, more than a year and this in, in very bad health. So the whole thing is a, a travesty from start to finish, both in the charges against him and uh, in the unfairness, the injustice of it and the, the uh, danger, the physical danger that he's, he's in really now has been discussed by the other people. But okay. I would say in the larger context, even more seriously, this is a danger not just to Julian Assange or an injustice to Julian Assange. It amounts to the withdrawal of our basic freedom uh, mm. that uh, of, a, of a democratic republic uh, in this in able, ability to get uh, the information that has been wrongfully withheld by the government. And it's something that the press should be regarding as a direct attack on their foundational purpose for being right. on their functions and uh, being concerned by Congress as to their ability to get information as an independent branch of government. This, needless to say, is not happening. It is a, uh, a great failure of our media so far uh, people like Consortium News, Joe Loria, Kevin Costola, uh, Shadow Proof, I think it's called, uh, did very good reporting on this. And um, Craig Marie, former ambassador, wrote things. But it was to them. Uh, somebody else pointed that the worldwide socialist web, I've seen one or two of their pieces, was covering this pretty well. These are not what we call mainstream uh, media. And <coughs> most people in the United States remain entirely ignorant that this is happening, what the facts are, or what the issues are, what the risks are for American democracy, what the constitutional issue, and unfortunately to this day, that's true of most of the press. So right. there's still time for that to be remedied. It needs very much to be remedied. And I'm very appreciative of programs like this or events like this that uh, enable us to alert others the problem thank you daniel yes as uh, as activists often say in latin american countries somos todos assange 
And the media, the mass media should recall this and say to themselves, we are all Julian Assange. Uh, thank you very much, speakers. And we now have about 10 minutes. We have uh, 17 questions. I'm uh, picking some and we'll, uh, we'll after our 10 minute uh, interchange here, uh, start to call on them or I'll read them up to specific uh, speakers. Uh, do the three of you have anything you'd like to say, given what others have said or something that you, you forgot to say? Let's uh, take about 10 minutes with that, and then we'll have a half an hour discussion. Uh, I would just briefly uh, say that I left out an important part of the hearing, which was Jen Robinson, one of Assange's lawyers. Yeah. Uh, her testimony was read in which she talked about a meeting with Dana Rohrbacher, who was a U.S. congressman at the time, who he said, well, she said was sent by Trump to the Ecuadorian embassy to offer a deal of pardon if he revealed who the source was of the uh, DNC emails. And Assange refused, sticking with the prince of not giving up his sources. However, this was important from the defense's point of view because it showed the political nature again of this. And some theorize that uh, Trump was furious that Assange wouldn't try to clear him from the Russiagate burden that he was under. And that's one reason he sent uh, he wanted him indicted and arrested. And in fact, as I said, um, Cassandra Fairbax testified that Trump ordered this arrest. This I just wanted to thank Marjorie and uh, Dan for what they said about our coverage. We were one of the few media outlets who were able to get access to the courtroom remotely. We saw every minute on the screen. And there was one other thing about the title of the book I missed, which was WikiLeaks, The Guardian's book. That's all I wanted to add. Oh, and one other thing about the fact, how can an Australian journalist working outside the United States be indicted by the Espionage Act because of a 1961 amendment to the Espionage Act that allowed universal jurisdiction? Before 61, Assange could not have been charged under this. And that came out of a case of an American diplomat in the embassy in Warsaw who was caught in bed with another woman and the public security services got a photograph. They blackmailed him to get classified documents. He took him out of the embassy and no longer on U.S. territory, went up to Polish territory. Some congressman got crazy about that and had this amendment put in. That's how Assange could be charged. Well, thank you, Joe. You've a actually a answered a couple of questions that have been asked. Uh, does anyone else, Marjorie or Daniel, have something you'd like to add or exchange that others have said? I, I see uh, one question here. Uh, questions, has the Espionage Act been challenged in the Supreme Court. Good question. The answer is no. Uh, the one person uh, who brought this up to the Supreme Court, uh, Morrison, who was the second person after me to be charged with this about 10 years after my case, uh, brought it up to the Supreme Court, but they denied, uh, they denied hearing it certiorari. So it has never been addressed in the Supreme mm. Court to this day, actually, with the constitutional issues of this. In if we go back 49 years, uh, the chances, the the legal basis of it, the chances for my even my uh, conviction being overturned, the act, that is the Espionage Act being overturned on constitutional grounds, were quite good at that point. That can't be said today. There's been enough changes we've seen in the Supreme Court even before Trump. Uh, so we can't at all be confident that the current uh, five uh, majority justices will notice that there are extreme constitutional violations going on here. But in any case, they haven't ever yet addressed it. Right. Um, we're going to get into the questions in just a couple of minutes. Is there anything else that you three would like to say regarding something that Marjorie? Yes. Yeah. Um, in 1919, there was a prosecution that went all the way to the Supreme Court, Schenck v. U.S. Schenck was a socialist. He was an official in the National Socialist Party. He was an anti-war activist. And uh, he was charged under the Espionage Act and convicted. And the Supreme Court upheld his conviction uh, against a First Amendment challenge, saying that by distributing flyers and circulars against the draft, um, he created a clear and present danger to the United States. 
and uh, therefore the the First Amendment didn't stop his prosecution under the Espionage Act. And uh, about the same time, another socialist, Eugene Debs, was tried and convicted um, under the Espionage Act. His conviction went all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, he gave an anti-war speech, um, and uh, his conviction was also affirmed by the Supreme Court. Wow. Okay. Um... If you don't have any more to say to each other, let's uh, open up to the questions. I, uh, I think I'll take the opportunity to select some. We have 22 questions, and, and Anne ba Batista, <laughs> Batista um, maybe I'm not pronouncing your last name very well, but she's asked several questions. Um, I'll pick a couple, and uh, I think uh, one should go to Joe. She's asked about... Uh, um, Vault 7, and, and she says something about you perhaps did not say that uh, Assange, or, or rather the uh, Democratic National uh, Committee's uh, emails were leaked rather than hacked. She's talking about the DN, not Vault 7, but the DNC and Podesta yeah. emails. Yeah, she also uh, mentioned Vault 7. I don't know if you could take uh, both those questions. Okay, well, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Uh, the DNC emails and the Podesta emails. Well, uh, the, the DNC hired a company called CrowdStrike to examine their servers, and they came up with uh, statements that Russia had hacked them. But an, in closed-door testimony that only became revealed this year with Sean Henry, who was the president of CrowdStrike, he said they had no evidence that there was exfiltration from the servers. So there was no proof of any hack, let alone by Russia. That's what the head of CrowdStrike said. So, of course, there are those like the Veterans Intelligence Professionals for Sanity, who published a consortium news, who have argued even earlier that this was an internal leak, that it couldn't have been transferred overseas because of the speed rates, et cetera. My point before was it didn't matter to me who, who got the emails because they were true. Uh, so it could be Russia. It could be somebody else. So I'm not saying it was Russia. I'm not saying it was anybody else. I don't know. I'm saying it's irrelevant from the point of view of journalism who the source was if the documents are verified and accurate. We're not talking about oral statements in an interview with a source. We're talking about documents. So that's what the position is. Uh, again, I, I don't think it's relevant, uh, but John Henry said that there was no exfiltration, that they had evidence, uh, even though they'd made statements all along and wound up in Miller's indictments that the 12 GRU agents were responsible for. But yeah. I know about Vault 7, I'm not sure what the question is. I can mention Vault 7 if you want me to. Could I make a point here, please, Marjorie, even to break in? I think we should all recognize these issues have nothing to do with the case brought against Julian. Literally nothing to do. We're talking about a hypothetical prosecution which has not been brought about events that took place after 2010. They have no bearing on the charges or the issues, the constitutional issues at all. So we could just as well argue, uh, we could talk about Breitbart, we could talk about any journalist you want uh, in some other case, but whatever Julian did after 2010, I, I, I don't know if any of these charges go to 2011, but uh, has really no bearing on this case. Uh, am I wrong? I think that's correct. That's correct. Okay. Uh, Yukari is asked, and I, I think this could be for anyone, um, given as it was, has just been mentioned, Daniel, thank you for saying that the, this COVID has now come to the cell block where Assange is. is, is someone has asked, uh, Yukari, uh, can't there be some emergency measure taken uh, available to the public or our lawyers that uh, to stop this uh, horrendous treatment of him now? Isn't this an extra motivation that can be used somehow. Julian Assange's defense team has argued to Judge Beraser in the London court that he is at particular risk for the coronavirus because of his pulmonary weaknesses and uh, pre-existing condition as a result of the lack of medical treatment, the tr medical treatment that was denied him when he was in the Ecuadorian embassy uh, by the UK government. And, uh, and there had been, I believe, even then, even a few months ago, uh, cases of the coronavirus in Belmarsh Prison, which is where Julian Assange is being held. And yet uh, she denied uh, that, uh, that request by his lawyers. 
Um, so he, he is in danger, he is in jeopardy of contracting the coronavirus. And if he does, it would be devastating to him. And, and her ruling cannot be challenged at this point uh, by a higher court? I think they could have taken a writ to a higher court. I don't, don't know if they did um, on that particular issue. Uh, we have the same situation in the United States where uh, prisons are basically incubators for, for the uh, COVID-19. And, uh, and those challenges don't go anywhere. You know, people who are incarcerated have, uh, have many fewer rights than people on the outside. Uh, one more question to you, Marjorie, and uh, the, the, the fact that there uh, has been disallowed uh, normal oral uh, oral closing remarks, uh, and apparently, I, I don't know, but it sounds like uh, the public uh, uh, will never know what the closing remarks are. Is this really legal? I mean, how, how can she get away with this? Well, I don't know what her justification was. She might be talking about national security, and I think extensive, I think uh, two or 300 pages of closing submissions by the defense and the prosecution uh, is, and I think that was November 10th, if I'm not mistaken. And then I think the prosecution has two weeks, that would be the 20th. Right. Okay. So it was the 16th plus 14 is what? Right. I'm not, not a great mathematician. Um, at any rate, the prosecution will give its closing submissions. They are, um, they're, they're extensive, they're in writing, but they, for some reason, they're not being released to the public. Well, I mean, how can we be sure that she's going to read 200 pages? We can never be sure that any judge is going to read anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Dennis asks, uh, why is the government, uh, what is the government's legal rationale for indicting a, a non-U.S. citizen under this uh, Espionage Act who, who allegedly committed crimes outside of the U.S. territory? I mean, he, uh, he's never lived in the United States. I mean, how, how can this happen? I think I answered that before by talking about that 1961 amendment. They have oh, yes. I'm sorry. They have I'm jurisdiction. Sorry. They can pick up any journalist anywhere in the world if they feel the U.S. government that they broke U.S. law, right. which technically he did. If you look at that section of the Espionage Act, which is unconstitutional, most reasonable people would say, but they have a universal jurisdiction in the Espionage Act. Right, uh, Trump um, has. It's been said that uh, Trump uh, intervened here through a uh, another politician, um, and the question goes out: uh, Does does this mean that the president could uh, individually drop the charges? And if that's the case, could uh, Biden uh, drop the charges? And if that's the case, can we not put pressure? Can there not be put uh, pressure by the public uh, to do this? This really goes to the whole issue of the independence of the Department of Justice, which is run by the Attorney General. And it mm. is the, the Attorney General is not the President's personal lawyer. Uh, the Attorney General is the Attorney General of the United States. And, uh, but Trump has made it very clear that he considers the Attorney General to be his personal lawyer. And uh, he fired Jeff Sessions for, uh, for recusing himself from the uh, Mueller investigation. And, uh, and, and now has his uh, lackey um, in, in, uh, in place. Um, but Biden has made it very clear, Joe Biden has made it very clear that he wants the Department of Justice to be independent. Uh, in fact, he has said when, when asked about whether or not uh, he would pursue or stand in the way of the indictment of Donald Trump for the many crimes that he has clearly committed, um, he said that he is going to remain, he wants to look forward, not backward, which is exactly what Barack Obama said about prosecuting the torturers from the Bush administration was a big mistake. Um, but Biden has said many times that he wants the attorney general and the Department of Justice to be independent. Um, that said, he, Barack Obama certainly had close communication with Eric Holder, his attorney general, and uh, 
And so I think that Biden, if there is cons- pressure put on Biden and, you know, he's not going to do things without pressure. That's what I'm writing about it, as we speak. Um, then perhaps he could be persuaded and uh, Barack Obama's example, um, following Barack Obama's example of not indicting Julian Assange because of the New York Times problem. That's an interesting point, Mar- Marjorie. This came out in the in the hearing, the politicization of the Department of Justice. Mm-hmm. That became a point for the defense to try to show this is a political case. And we heard that, that uh, Barr, the attorney general, actually believes in this cockamamie unitary executive idea. Mm-hmm. And he believes, and he said in speeches this year, Barr, that the president should be the one to determine who's indicted or not, as if he were a king. Mm-hmm. So uh, Barr is a big part of the problem, too, not just a Trump, as you as you pointed out. But that came out in the hearing. That's an interesting point you made, Marjorie, that, that Biden, if you wanted to go back to the rationale that the Obama administration had for not indicting, could use this. And right. that, would, that would be great. And Trump also could pardon Assange. Some people saying that he might pardon Assange and Snowden just out of thumbing his nose at the establishment. Someone has asked uh, that uh, you said uh, that Julian uh, would be handed uh, uh, regarding the uh, the request by uh, Sweden the second time to to ask uh, 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 Assange to come to Sweden to be asked once again about this sexual claim. Uh, how how did this come out that uh, uh, that that this would be the case that if he would be handed over to the CI rather to the U.S. if he did come to Sweden. How did this come to light? No, well, this is what his lawyers and he said at the time uh, that he went into the embassy, that he could not afford to go back to Sweden because he felt he would be uh, onwardly extradited to the United States. And that's, we now know that that's what the U.S. wanted to happen. So uh, that's what that was about. Uh, there was another okay. point was he, uh, the Stefania Morizzi, the Italian journalist, in her great work in getting foyers, was able to show the British Crown Prosecution Service put enormous pressure on the Swedish government not to interview Assange via video, which the Sweden had apparently done with other, in other cases with someone they needed to interview abroad. So the British government all along did not want Assange to go to Sweden. And they, in fact, they didn't want, sorry, they wanted him to leave the embassy and go to Sweden. And once he stepped out of the embassy, they could have arrested him for his bail skipping. And then they could have started, then the U.S. could have unveiled the indictment if it was ready. And, um, well, the Bomb Administration, it would not have happened. But the, Sp- the Swedish issue was dropped four times, we have to keep in mind. Four different times, I believe. Three times. Okay, three times, that's enough. The, that case was dropped. And he, right. he feared, he didn't fear that case so much as being sent to the United States if he'd gone back to Sweden. Okay. Uh, regarding the es- Espionage Act, uh, Marjorie, do you know if there's any... Uh... Are any treaties? I mean, the, the the fact that the Espionage Act allows journalists to be picked up anywhere in the world. Uh, are there any treaties, uh, international treaties, or treaties with the United States that uh, that prohibit such a thing? Well, as I said, the extradition, if he is extradited to the United States, the extradition treaty between the United Kingdom and the United States is going to be determinative. And that extradition treaty prohibits the extradition of someone for a political offense. And exposing war crimes, which is what WikiLeaks and Julian Assange did uh, in 2010-2011, is a classic political offense. So just under that extradition treaty, that would prevent his extradition. And one of the grounds for extradition is espionage. He's not charged with espionage, but he's charged under the Espionage Act. So that's another ground to show that the extradition is being requested for a political offense and a reason that the judge should deny extradition. And if she doesn't, if she grants extradition, then as I said, there would be several levels of appeal and eventually it would get to the European Court of Human Rights and they would assess the legalities under this extradition treaty between the United States and the United Kingdom.